Well, let's start our discussion of Washington geology with a global perspective of plate tectonics, an idea proposed in about 1912 by Alfred Wagoner, but not really accepted until the 1960s. We don't need to go into depth on this, just to note that the land masses are separated uh, or the continents on different plates, actual physical pieces of the Earth's crust, and they've been moving about as fast as your fingernails grow that at one time there was one big continent called Pangaea broken up into other subcontinents and you can see them fitting together here. Here's, for example, South America and what will become Africa, uh, all turned upside down. They moved around a lot until they finally looked like this. Uh, several pieces of evidence for this, one really obvious one that will often be pointed out is how Africa and South America would fit together so nicely if you just brought them closer together. And plate tectonics says that they have been drifting apart from that original position for lots of years. All right, so how does that affect us here in the Pacific Northwest? Well, you'll notice that there's this one funny little plate out here, the Juan de Fuca plate. You may have heard of the Strait of Juan de Fuca opening up uh, Puget Sound. Zooming into Washington State itself, I want us to remember that about 250 million years ago, the North American plate, and we consider Washington part of North America, really only came to about here. And the rest of this out where we're sitting was ocean at the time. So what formed all of this land and why are there so many mountains here? So the different forces that caused each of those. I want to look into that by looking at a cross-section of the state. So let's look at it from the side. And over here, we have the ocean. This is the west coast of Washington. This is the eastern border then where we meet Idaho. And I want to concentrate here on the geology itself and talk about then eventually how that affected the climate and then how both of those affected the life on the land itself. And we can consolidate those concepts into something we call ecoregions, which we'll come back to here in a moment. Okay, now with all that set up, let's talk a little bit about the North American plate that I said came to here about 250 million years ago and then started accumulating more and more land. And it did that because another plate way over here, the Juan de Fuca plate, let's call them Juan for short, uh, came and started crashing into the North American plate. Now something has to give, the North American plate is much larger, and uh, so a lot of that soil and rock just gets lifted up. And so we have some uplift over here that uh, creates the, the coast range. What happens to the rest of that rock? It has to go somewhere, right? It can't just disappear and it can't build forever into mountains that just you know go into the skies. So what happens is that it subducts. It goes actually under the North American plate. Now that creates lots and lots of friction in here, heat builds up, and then we start getting that heat rising along with some molten rock, and we get volcanic activity starting over here, building the Cascades. And this is starting about 46 million years ago. Again, this is just a broad overview. Lots and lots of great stuff that I skipped in there. But that's when our volcanic activity starts. Lots and lots of volcanic activity. We're still considering many of the volcanoes in the Cascade Range, Rainier included, as an active volcano. And that just shows that geologically speaking, uh, these are still rocking and rolling. Now, what about where we're staying on? We're just talking about you know, how did the ground get beneath your feet, the geology? Well, starting about 17 million years ago, 
then we got a bunch of lava flows, some of the biggest lava flows in the world. So we kind of live in a special place. And, and again, uh, time and time again, and, and you'll see this when you go around hiking places and you see a big cliff face, a lot of times you'll see a bunch of basalt and it changes its form. And that's evidence of one lava flow covering up another lava flow. And that formed much of the Columbia Plateau. This also all explains why we don't have dinosaur fossils in Washington state, because dinosaurs went extinct about 66 million years ago. But you can see from what I've drawn up here, um, they were gone by the time really most of the land was formed that sits beneath your feet. So there you have it. All right, well, that explains most of this. I'm gonna to return to this idea of ecoregions for a minute to fill in a, a few last uh, sort of gaps. One is the North Cascades and another one is Puget Trough. And then I have a little more to say about the Columbia Plateau. And let's start with that one. So about 20,000 years ago, so we're talking really young, geologically speaking, that's thousand years ago, sloppy A, um, there were a bunch of floods, sometimes called the Missoula floods or the Ice Age floods. Most of Canada and uh, Northern United States was covered in a giant ice sheet. Sometimes that would melt and it created a huge flood. And I'll talk more about that in a moment that flooded most of the Columbia Plateau. And the ground you're standing on is not a bunch of purely lava flows. Above those lava flows are a bunch of sediment. That's the sediment left behind by these giant lakes and provides the soils that we plant all our crops in over here on the Columbia Plateau. All right, so that's that one. Uh, North Cascades, what about that one? Well, the Cascades are not all one thing and the Northern Cascades, these sharper, more rugged peaks, they're really a mix of geology uh, that I think you'd be better off taking a geology class to really understand what's going on there. Uh, way more complicated, still a lot of uplift and volcanic activity, but they are pretty different. Once you get north of Interstate 90, then the Cascades are just geologically different. The last interesting story is over here for the Puget Trough. And this again has to do with uh, ice ages and uh, this time not flooding, but that giant ice sheet. And so here, we have glaciers at work. That giant ice sheet came down out of Canada and would fill up this whole area with ice. And you get a bunch of ice together, that's a glacier, and that ice moves downhill and slides and grinds everything up with it, carving out these really deep valleys and leaving behind a lot of sediment. And there you have Puget Sound. So that explains um, a, a number of landforms. Glaciers are not limited uh, to Puget Trough. I don't want to leave you with that impression, but that's responsible for a major landscape feature within Washington State and others elsewhere. There are many places in mountains uh, around here with very deep valleys, and those are carved by glaciers from ages past and a little more recent geologic history than some of the volcanic activity that I've been talking about. Here's a quick look at those Missoula or Ice Age floods and a map. And you can see how nicely this flood path right here corresponds to the Columbia Plateau. This was a giant lake as all these flood waters from Montana, the Missoula area, came out to the ocean through the Columbia Gorge and carved that. Um, they got backed up and deposited their sediment. And you see that uh, in some of our landscapes. You got all the sediment down here and then these real steep cliffs over on the side that have been carved out by fast flowing water. So those Missoula floods, we have to thank for those breathtaking sights through the Columbia River Gorge. If you've ever driven that, uh, just breathtaking but also for the deep soils that we have that support all the agriculture 
in the Columbia Plateau. To take a slightly different look at that, here are the ecoregions again, and I just want to point out the Columbia Plateau here in purple, and notice how level it is. There's very little topographic relief. It's just pretty plain. Versus the Okanagan, which has some similarities, but a different geologic past, and you can see these deep valleys and ridges and another valley and a ridge. Uh, this is going to shape it and the, the life there differently than you are in the Columbia Plateau. Let's take a brief break from maps to talk about the landscape we see around us. When you look around, you probably see rock. I refer to that as parent rock because that rock is what breaks down into soil. Once you incorporate the organics and everything else, then you have soil. And in soil, you can grow plants. And the plants determine what sort of other animals you have there. And now it should be a little more clear, why are we talking about this in a biology class? Well, the rocks matter because they break down into soil, which determine what plants grow there and what animals can be there. How does this determine it? Well, that parent rock determines a couple of key features. One is the pH of the soil, whether it's acidic or basic, and that just has to do with the chemistry of the rocks themselves, and what sort of minerals that soil has. Is it high in magnesium, iron, calcium? That's really determined by that parent rock material, not the organics. So that's gonna influence the soil chemistry, which again influences plants, which is going to influence animals. Well, take a look at that parent rock on a statewide basis. We can look at the surface geology, just the stuff right at the very surface. And you see that most of the state, as you would think for a very young geologic state, is actually rock. Not a lot of soil. Not like you find in the Midwest when you go back there and you find old land with deep soils. They take time to accumulate. And so there are a few different types of rock. And we'll notice that in orange here we have volcanic rocks. And they really dominate, especially in the middle of the state in the East and West Cascade region. And even out into the Columbia Plateau where we had all those lava flows out to the east, but those got covered up, remember, a lot of them by the Missoula floods. We'll come back to that. There's also some sedimentary rocks, rocks that were at the bottom of lakes and oceans. Uh, they would have had gotten lifted up uh, as all that uh, rock was exposed. And we see a little bit of that over here on the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, where, remember, Juan de Fuca plate came running in and there's the uplift. So it makes sense that you would find sedimentary rock that was at the bottom of the ocean now lifted up. And then the, the last type of rock we have that shows a little more geologic dynamic uh, complexity is metamorphic rock. That can be either sedimentary or volcanic, but it gets heated up and squished like crazy and you'll see a lot of that up in the North Cascades, along with some other sedimentary rock. Remember I said North Cascades was complicated. And up in the Okanagan Plateau as well, you'll see a mix of both metamorphic and also some sedimentary rocks. Uh, I'll leave those for geology class if you want to find out more about those. Um, but quite a bit more complexity there. Back to the more biologically relevant, I did want to return to this one, unconsolidated deposits. That's basically soil. So there's sediment that got settled out of the lake. Oops. Uh, remember that was Lake Lewis formed with Missoula floods. So that's all this sort of tan in the Columbia Plateau. So there's a lot of soil there. And consequently, you find a lot of agriculture. The other one, you may not be able to read it, it says glacial deposits. And we find those mostly here in the Puget Trough. So uh, leftover by glaciers. And those are the two areas where we have deeper soils where a more diverse range of plants can grow. Here's a great example of that. This is up 
getting toward Mount Rainier, you see these huge basalt columns. So yeah, we have lots and lots of rock. But even on top of that, you see a pretty lush forest, but that's growing on a pretty thin layer of soil. Conifers do fine with that. Uh, just thin, gravelly soils, they tolerate it just fine. It takes time to form some deep soils. One way that can happen is through erosion. So erosion usually involves some sort of water. In the case of glaciers here, like on Mount Rainier, it's solid water, uh, ice flowing downhill and grinding down the rocks where they meet uh, and forming soil. It can be rains and rivers, flooding, lakes, all that sort of stuff. Even wind can actually erode the soil. And there are other actions as well that will break down those rocks and form more and more soil, things that help the rock break down into smaller pieces. Soil uh, often gets carried away, but it does accumulate in some areas, and you may not appreciate the geology of a meadow. And so the reason that this meadow is out here in the middle of the forest is, like I said, these conifers tolerate kind of thin, gravelly, poor soils, but the grasses and sedges here in the meadow don't do as well. And they do better in areas where you've accumulated lots of fine soils like silt and clay, because those both hold on to moisture better. They tend to stay wet longer and also certain minerals like um, potassium and nitrogen and the grasses and the wildflowers in the meadow need those and so they can thrive and outcompete the trees in this geologically different patch. So it's probably just a, a low area, got flooded, soils accumulated there, now you have a meadow once you probably had a bit of a pond. And a lot of times you'll see in the mountains that uh, process happening over time. The topography, uh, the, the shape of the land affects both soils and climate. So I wanted to address each of them. Basically, the steeper the slopes, the more erosion you're going to get. So you're not going to find deep soils on slopes like this. Uh, those soils tend to accumulate in the valleys below or in areas where there's a gentler slope, you have more time for soil accumulation. And so uh, pretty easy rule to remember there, steeper slopes, uh, coarser soils. Uh, I said something about the climate. Well, the cold air flows also off these hills at night and accumulates in valleys that get really chilly at night. And then that air will flow back up the slope during the day. And so there's a few sort of landscape level activities that happen that influence climate, but also soil formation. I want to start moving from geology to climate and really kind of talking about the influence of geology on climate, specifically, like we've just been talking about the topography. One, we can see over here, this is the elevation of different parts of the state, again, looking at a cross section that for every thousand feet that we go up, then the temperature typically drops about three to five degrees Fahrenheit. So as we go up, then it gets colder. And because of that, all the moisture in the air starts to consolidate and precipitate, and then we get that rain shadow effect we've talked about before. Well, this has another sort of downstream effect. Remember the rain shadow effect basically says that the eastern half of the state is going to be dry and the western half is going to be fairly moist. Well, that means that the temperature is usually a little more stable over here because moist air tends to hold in heat better than where you get greater humidity, then those swings in temperature are a little bit less than they are over here where it's dry. 
and you get really hot days and really frigid nights, hot days, frigid nights, things like that. So uh, our climate is a little moodier over here, you might say. And that certainly is going to influence the plants and animals that live in these various ecoregions. The Okanagan is a great example. I mean, the Columbia Plateau is pretty moody, but the Okanagan even more so because they are dry because they're over the rain shadow or over the Cascades and in the rain shadow. Um, they are high in elevation. And so this leads to some really dramatic swings um, in, in temperature. Plus, they're pretty far to the north, you know, in terms of just latitude, they're right next to Canada. And so that's some of the biggest swings we see in the state. All of these really influence the plants and animals that live in a place quite a bit. Well, let's return to the maps to see how that plays out. And so here, again, we have that topographic map. We have the Cascade Mountain Range bisecting the state and the precipitation map up front. You can see pretty dramatically by these colors that in the east side of the state, you know, our precipitation is here and pretty much everywhere on the west side of the state, you have lots more precipitation. Not surprising, but there's the proof. How about temperatures? Uh, another look at the state. Now you kind of expect that, and again, kind of these, uh, so this is, as I say, the hardiness zone. So this has to do with the minimum temperature. So the average minimum temperature This is for the last uh, few decades. And so really, really frigid is gonna be these, kind of oddly enough, the, these um, reddish colors. And so there we're reaching into the negative 20 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit range. That is cold. Where are those things? Way up here. We kind of expect that up north. We'd expect it in higher altitudes, which is what we're seeing. Um, so Okanagan Plateau, like I was just talking about, gets pretty frigid. Um, and same with the North Cascades. Those are gonna be some of our coldest areas in the state. We'd expect the Cascades themselves to be pretty cold. And you can see where the, the peaks are. See Mount Rainier right here um, gets obviously frigid up on top. But just the elevation itself, we'd expect to be pretty cold. But look at over here, the whole Columbia Plateau, right? Look at how cold that is. I mean, it's basically about this, similar at least, to the Cascade Mountains. Why? Because it's dry. And so overnight we get pretty cold, even though it warms up the next day uh, more than the mountains might, you still get some really cold minimum temperatures. But the entire west side of the state is all green and dark green. You know, that's stuff down in here. So we're not getting as cold of temperatures overnight, uh, which means different plants can grow there because they don't have to worry quite as much about those really harsh freezing temperatures. Freezing is one thing, but the further you get below freezing, that's pretty harsh on plants. Well, let's sum up a bit. Uh, first, let's talk about soils. So looking across the state, where do we have deep soils? So I wanna really talk about specifically deep soils. For a young state, we shouldn't have much, but because of glaciers, this whole Puget Trough and all the Columbia Plateau has some pretty deep soils deposited by glaciers and lakes. What else? Uh, what about temperatures? Well, our dividing line is really right down the Cascades here. Um, if we go to the east, then we have really hot summers in the day, and we have very cold winters, right? Uh, frigid if you're up in the Okanagan and just plain chilly when you're in the Columbia Plateau. Same with um, the Cascades. Uh, and then over here, everything is quite a bit more mild, depending on your elevation. Now, in the North Cascades, yes, those also get frigid, so I don't want to uh, belittle that. They do get very cold, and the higher in elevation you get, 
um, the colder it gets. And then lastly, just a little bit about uh, the geology. Um, most of it is volcanic, right? And so we don't even need to draw that in. Where do we get some interesting stuff going on? Um, certainly this whole northern area, North Cascades, Okanagan, uh, Canadian Rocky Mountains. You get some really different stuff going on up there than most of the rest of the state. Over here along the northwest coast, uh, then you get some of that sedimentary material uh, built up by accretion as the uh, Juan de Fuca plate crashed into the North American plate. And those are really your big areas of interest. Um, and I hope that gives you a good background for uh, the deep history of Washington State and how that's influenced all the different plants and wildlife that live here.